welcome to the Jody Bunting podcast, how to run a marathon with Dave Sullivan, the sales manage- manager and one of my old slimmers from Alveston in Derby. But guys, he's originally from Leicester, the home of Walker's Crisps. Why are Walker's Crisps so important to you, Dave? Because I'm a crispaholic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I can't think of Leicester anymore without thinking about Walker's crisps and yourself. <laughs> so I am a, I am an absolute crisp monster, although not lately. Well, this is what I was going to say, Dave. You have your slip. Your face is looking so slim. How much have you lost? Uh, since January, I, I weighed in about fourteen twelve in January, and I've got myself down to thirteen and a half. Wow! How do you feel? Yeah, I feel really good at the moment. Probably as good as I felt for 10, 15 years. Not just the weight loss, just the everything with with everything I've been doing, which we're going to talk about. Um, but when you're doing a lot of running, yes, you get some weight loss. But I think the shape, the body shape is more noticeable than the scales, yeah. if that makes sense. So although I've lost, uh, what we're talking about, 19 pounds-ish, then the body shape shows as if i've lost more than that if that makes sense yeah because i'm a lot i feel a lot slimmer than losing a stone and a bit and i've known you for 13 years back in 2010 and you've lost three star over three stones since then haven't you yeah oh in the past yeah yeah definitely i mean i was uh i was over 15 i think I got, at my heaviest i think i was up to about 15 10 yeah and at my lightest at my lightest i did get down to just below 13 i think so how did you get from 1510 in those 13 years to now becoming a marathon runner? You know, how did you start running? Um, well, I suppose the, the first motivation really was my granddaughter was born just over six years ago with cystic fibrosis. And the first thing that I did was in September uh, 2019, we ran uh, the Leicester 10K. So I thought I'd do it for cystic fibrosis. I couldn't run. Um, genuinely couldn't run. I uh, hadn't done any significant running since I was at school, apart from a bit of football and a bit of squash and stuff like that, but not dedicated running. And my thoughts were that she would suffer with lung capacity and things like that with cystic fibrosis. So doing any sort of long distance exercise would also make me shorter breath. So it kind of yeah. gave me some symmetry, if you like, um, as a motivation to do it. So we did the less to 10k, um, got round in a surprisingly okay time of just over an hour and eight minutes, and then almost literally did nothing again after that till the following summer. Um, and we we used to literally run a couple of lampposts and then walk a bit, and a couple of lampposts and walk a bit. So when I say I couldn't run, I genuinely could not run any sort of distance whatsoever. And this is one of the training tips on the Couch to 5K app, isn't it? To go from lamppost to lamppost. Yeah. So so we were kind of doing that naturally anyway. And then thought, OK, well, let's have a go at the Couch to 5K. So then we picked up the program, um, which is a great program if nobody's ever used it before. I was talking to a colleague of mine recently who's um, trying to lose some weight. He's, he's a, a reasonably decent sized fella. And he's doing couch to 5K and he was saying how conscious he is and everything else. And we spoke about park runs and all these sorts of things. Um, and it is a very, very gradual process. People say, oh, I could never run five kilometers. If you'd yeah. have asked me four years ago, I'd say exactly the same thing. Yeah. If you'd have asked me even two years ago about running a marathon, I'd have said, you're off your rocker. <laughs> um, but one thing has led to another. And, and here we are. And, and when did... When did Park Run come into this thing then? So you were doing the 10K for charity. Did you start Park Run around that time or was it after or before? Well, no, it was after. The the, the 10K was a, kind of a one-off and stood in the park in, in Leicester's Abbey Park waiting to start, thinking, looking at looking around, thinking, looking at the route here, we're going to have to run at least two kilometres to get out of the park. And if we don't run two kilometres, we're going to look really stupid. Because all these people around here that look like the proper runners. Um, so set off thinking this is going to be a real difficult, you know, couple of kilometres. Ended up running for five and a half kilometres without stopping. Such was the adrenaline and the encouragement of the crowds and other runners around you and everything else. 
And, and it really does make a massive difference running within a group compared to being out there on your own or just with a running partner or a couple of you or whatever. So we did that and it was just, that was it. Didn't do anything then for 12 months. Then we did the couch to 5K, got up to sort of 5K-ish. And I joined a little group near here at Elverson Castle called Runner Beans. And they used to run around the perimeter of Elverson Castle. So that was like a three kilometer route. So even when we were doing that, I was struggling to run three kilometers. Yeah. Um, and then at Runner Beans, they said, why don't you try and do park runs? And the first park runs I did, I didn't run it all. I had to walk some of it. Um, and I think my first early park run times were sort of 35, 36 minutes. And then me being competitive, of course, one thing leads to another and you try to improve your time and you try to improve your time and then try to get below 32 and 31 and 30. And so it goes on. Um, to the stage now where I did a park run, not last weekend, the weekend before. And obviously I'm in much better shape now than I was with all the training I've done in the last 12 months. And I did a park run in 24 minutes, 10 seconds. Amazing. Which is absolutely off the scale for me, really. Well done. Um, so I was, I, was, uh, I was quite happy with that. I, I set off and my watch sort of played up. So I thought, oh, I'll just run as quick as I can and see what happens. And that's what happened. <laughs> and you came back to me a couple of, of years ago to, to lose a bit more weight in one of my Christmas challenges. And you mentioned to me then that you were doing park run and you were trying to get a marathon place. Uh, and this is when I suggested to do it for Starlight, like I did the London Marathon for Starlight. Yeah. So how did that Starlight Marathon, which was only six months ago, how did that go? <laughs> um, training was really tough. Um, and obviously I've done two lots of training now because uh, people may or may not know the marathon is typically in, uh, in April. But during COVID in 2020, there wasn't one at all, understandably with lockdown. 2021, it was supposed to take place, but then they ended up putting it back six months to October. So 2022, they kept it in October. And now this year, they've brought it back to its original position in April. So this time, it's only a six-month turnaround. So last year, I trained all the way through the summer, um, which was pretty hard. Uh, so yeah. I followed a book last year. I followed a, a training book. It was Chris Evans off Virgin Radio. I followed his training program, which is day by day by day by day. Do this, do that, do the other. Um, and got into a reasonable shape for the marathon. I'll say reasonable shape. wasn't in great shape. was in reasonable shape for the marathon. And we got round in five hours, nine minutes and 59 seconds. Great. Which was kind of okay, but I wanted to be under five hours. So for me, that was, as soon as I saw my time, I thought, I'm going to have to do it again. Because <laughs> you were doing it with your wife and you were being respect, a being, being a respectable husband and staying with her, weren't you? Oh, we ran it all together. Yeah. Side by side. We ran the whole thing all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. And And to be fair, I wouldn't. I wouldn't level any accusation against I was slower because of. We both yeah. ran at a, the same sort of pace. My and, training's carried on, and Sharon said she'll never run another marathon as long as she lives. I'm with um, you, Sharon. I said that exact same thing. <laughs> but mentally, I think it was important for you to stay together as well, because that's the challenge, isn't it, to keep on going? I think what I found difficult this time round compared to uh, doing it the first time is I've done all of my training on my own. Yeah. So when you're out for your long runs and it builds up, builds up, builds up. Um, and the longest run I've done in the last few weeks is 22 miles. So I've been out there for almost four hours and being out for four hours in the street, on your own, down the side yeah. of the door and up and around by a private park or whatever. It's a long time to be out on your own. Yeah. Um, and, and, in a funny sort of way, you learn a lot about yourself because you have to motivate, purely you have to motivate yourself. You know, yes, you could stop. Yes, you could pop in Starbucks and have a coffee or whatever, but it's all down to your own personal drives, I suppose. But what I have tried to do is in the last, uh, I think seven out of the last long, part, uh, long runs I've done, I've done a number of kilometres and try to time it so I to get to Alveston Park just as park run starting. Perfect. And then I do park run, and then I do a few kilometres afterwards. So the craziest thing I've ever done, and if you'd have asked me this a few years ago when I started park run, I ran 15 miles before I did a park run. Oh. <laughs> then, I, then I did park run, and then I did another couple of miles home. So <laughs> What was your just... time that week? 
Normal. Uh, I think I was just over 30 minutes that week, 31, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, inevitably slower. Um, but uh, yeah, I, but what, what I, that what motivated me to do that is I mentioned a bit ago about when you run with a crowd, it pulls you along. Yeah. So having already done 15 miles, if I was doing another five purely on my own, it probably would have been really tough mentally. Yeah. But you do part run and you're just running around with everybody else and there's euphoria that goes with that. And then afterwards you think, well, I've only got another couple of miles to do. So <laughs> yeah, exactly, it, yeah. It kind, of, it kind of drags you around. And how was so your experience? Really how was your experience running for Starlight Children's Foundation last year? Yeah, really good. I mean, they were supportive. Um, between us, we raised just over five and a half thousand pounds for them, which we were very pleased with. Yeah. Um, spoke to them about running again for them this year. That one of their concerns was, with it only being six months, would I still be able to get the sponsorship and one thing and another? Um, so this time. You know, it's a different charity, but it is a charity that's very close to my heart. I'm running for Dementia UK this time. Yeah. And I lost my uncle Bill to uh, dementia many years ago. And he was like a second dad when I was growing up. He was the kind of guy that worked all his life, wanted to retire early, didn't have children, wanted to retire early. He retired at 61. Um, he got diagnosed with dementia almost immediately after he, re after he retired. And he was dead by the time he was 65. Oh. Which, you know, impacted me quite a lot back then. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm I'm running for Dementia UK this time. Right. We will, of course, give out the links for your sponsorship um, at the end. Lovely. Just, just going back to your uh, weight loss story again, what was it that made you change and how did you make those changes to lose the over three stone? What, way, way back 13 years ago? Yes. Um... I think what, back then I came along to the group with a partner that I was with at the time that you'll remember, and I was supporting her for her weight loss. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just come along. Yeah. And then one thing led to another, and it was uh, the program called Derby's Biggest Loser. And uh, there must have been 20 of us at the start or something like that. And I became competitive, and every week somebody had lost four pounds, six pounds. And I thought, well, I want to lose more, and I see if I can lose a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more. And in that, if I remember rightly, eight week program, um, I lost 27 pounds, if I remember right. Yeah, I think it was around that. Yeah. Um, I think I'm fairly sure I went at that stage from 15.2 to 13.3 in eight yeah. weeks. And it was just eating, eating good stuff. Walkers lost a lot of business during that eight weeks. Um, the, the pubs didn't see me. Um, I was playing golf regularly at the time, and I remember standing in the, the bar after a round of golf and drinking water or squash and not drinking any alcohol whatsoever. So I was just I was just very focused, which is me all over. If I choose to do something, then I focus and, and do it. Um, and marathon being another example, I suppose. Um, but the weight loss, it's partly the competitive animal in me. Yeah, but also, but also, you know, if you're going to throw yourself into something, do it. Don't, don't don't just say you might do it. Just do it. What always makes me smile is you and your friend Pete, who's also one of my slimmers. Both of you say this expression where you're like, right, I'm going back on Slim Brother Basics, Pate and Rivita. Here we go. Because both yeah. of you on the road, so this is like one thing that you both found was yeah, easy yeah. on the road. Yeah, yeah. Pate, I still have, I still have Rivita and Pate for lunch regularly. Great. Um, it's, it's one of my staple staple foods. Porridge for breakfast, rivita and pate for lunch is, is regular Monday to Friday food, and then just a, a regular meal in the evening. Great. Right. Now let's talk a little bit more about actually the marathon places, especially the London marathon places, because they're really hard to get. What What's the process of actually getting to run it? Uh, well, for me, it was uh, we applied, applied through the, for the ballot places. Um, which is incredibly difficult to get. Hundreds of thousands of people apply, not just from the UK, all over the world. Um, I've applied twice and failed to get in twice. So these uh, are the three to... places that you have to pay for, isn't it, to get in? Yeah, you, the way it works, you, you pay a fee up front, and if you get in, you run the marathon. If you don't get in, they send you some merchandise. So you get like a, a nice tracksuit top that says TCS London Marathon and whichever year it is. So you get something, even if you don't get in. I and didn't the rest know that. Of the money, 
yeah yeah you've got two um, of those so, then have you dave yeah i've got two of those <laughs> so you pay up whatever it is 45 50 quid and you get something and then the remainder of that whatever that value is goes then into the charity ah yeah so this so this year the, the london marathon charity is great ormond street so whatever money they make goes into great ormond street and then of course if you don't get through the ballot there are a number of charities that love to have runners uh, and you can apply for charity places so at the moment there's the running exhibition that always takes place immediately before the marathon and lots of the charity stalls will be there you know trying to encourage people to run for them next year or encouraging them to apply to run for them next year um in the case of dementia uk they've got 225 runners this year wow and out of those, out of those 225 runners so far as a group we've raised just over three hundred thousand pounds wow <laughs> that's fantastic isn't it it's really good really good um, so this... I mean, just, just touching on dementia a little bit a little, yeah. little known facts that people don't know probably is on average in the uk every three minutes somebody is diagnosed with dementia yeah and that you know they, they say by year 2025 they expect to be over a million people in the uk affected by dementia and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger so what dementia uk do is it's a support network rather than a research network yeah so when you ring the free phone number for dementia uk you get directly through to speak to a dementia trained as they call them admiral nurse so whether you're a carer whether you're a sufferer whether you're a family member of somebody you can ring up dementia uk and talk to somebody who can give you accurate advice immediately over the phone so you get 100 percent immediate response yeah. support for whatever the circumstances might be uh, and that's the way they do so these nurses cost around about 45 50 grand a year and um, they've now got around about 42 nurses and what we're doing at the moment for the london marathon will put more people on the ends of phones to be able to support more people so more sufferers you're going to need more support yeah so that's, that's great that's what we're looking to achieve yeah so going back to the logistics then so once you've got your place either through the ballot or through your uh, charity what happens then with regards to training have the charity been giving you the information or have you you researched researched it yourself or does a training plan come directly from the london marathon there are training plans with london marathon so once you've registered and been accepted to run with a charity, they, they then link you into uh, the London Marathon and you then get regular email updates and uh, information and training plans. But a lot of the training plans that are out there, they aren't one size fits all. So everybody's got to try and find whatever works for them. Yeah. A quick Google and you can find any number of training plans but you've got to try to work out what works for you around your own personal circumstances. Some of them might be encouraging you to run three or four times a week, or, or some might only be two or three times a week. You have, you have got to do a lot of work and run regularly. So it does take up an awful lot of time. I said last year, I used Chris Evans's book, but this year, because I've joined a running club, my running coach has written a plan for me, but my right. plan is this, this time based on, being a bit more of an experienced runner with a, a, a level of an entry level, if you like, of fitness rather than starting at a base level of fitness. So he's pushed me really hard. And the target for Sunday, I, I was five, let's say just under 5'10 last time. I would like to certainly be low 40, 445 this time. That's, that's my primary aim. Great. And that doesn't sound a lot. But when you say 25 minutes, that's a minute per mile quicker I need to be. Yeah. But don't tell anybody I told you this, but I'm aiming for less than 4.30. Oh, <laughs> you're going to blow everyone out the ground, are you, Dave? That's the plan. <laughs> my, my, my aim to, is to be 4.30. I'd like to be around 4.30. That's what my coach has pushed me at, at all year. And he says, I, I will I will train you to get you around in 4.30. And, and I've, I've worked and ran so much harder this time. I'm so much fitter, so much quicker, yeah. so much leaner. Um, I'll give you an example of park run times a bit ago. But even some of my long runs, I did a 22-mile run. And if I'd have carried on at that pace, mm. then I would have been about 4.38. Wow. 
Wow. So I'm there or thereabouts. Yeah. But the other thing that people don't realise about London Marathon is you don't run 26.2 miles at London because what people get in your way. So you're having to go left and right and dodge and everything else. And even when I ran it last year, I ran just under 27 miles. Wow. People definitely don't know that, do they? No. So last year, my, my marathon time on Strava was five hours six, I think. But my official chip time was five to some five ten ah you see you're so, finding out all those little logistics that make all the difference yeah, yeah. on the day well, there's a blue line a faint painted blue line and if you watch the elites on the tv you'll think well, why are they running in the middle of the road why aren't they running at the side of the road or why aren't they here or why aren't they there they will be following religiously that blue line sometimes ah, you see it so... on the tv but it's faint because it's blue on black you don't see it very well yeah if you can stay on the blue line, that is 26.2 miles. But, of course, right. you're not ever going to, as a crowd, run on the blue line. <laughs> so you are talking then about the actual logistics of the day. So what exactly happens from morning to, all, to when you've crossed the finishing line? What time do you have to be uh, there? Well, there's all sorts of nutritional stuff that we can talk about in a moment as, as preparation, which is as important, if not more important, than putting one foot in front of the other. Um, last year, I stayed in London on the Friday and the Saturday. This time, I'm going down tomorrow morning, stopping over Saturday night, going with the run club. So slightly different this time. Last year, I ended up being interviewed by the BBC, which kind of caused us a problem because we had to go, it's about half a mile away from our start point to find the BBC people, and then all the way back again. So... That probably didn't help in preparation, one in terms of time, but also in the fact that I'd done, I think I'd done something like eight and a half thousand steps before we even set off last year. No. And I didn't really want to be in that situation. No. So you had to go <laughs> earlier like, as well then, did you? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens logistically, you, you enter the marathon, you fill out all the stuff online and you give them a predicted time, which I would have done back in, December, November, I think, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then nearer, like a few weeks ago, you give them an updated guesstimate of what you think your finish time is going to be. Then you get put into one of three primary places. There are four places. One's for elites and, and celebrities. And so you've got Red Star, Blue Star and Green Star. And, and within those starts, they ha then have start waves. So the elites go off at I think it's 9 30 in the morning and the mass runners don't set off before 10 only because they don't want us to catch them up that's why that, yeah they just, they just don't want to be they don't want to be embarrassed by us that's that's the that's the real issue there um so then you, you have a wave number so it starts with wave one goes all the way through so i think it's wave 18 and they set off every seven minutes so people have this vision in their head that there's 40,000 people at the start line and they just all go and funnel through or whatever. It's incredibly well organised. So they'll set you off in, in little gaps distances. So there might be a thousand people at a time go from each start point in each wave. So there's still quite a few people. And then there'll be a gap of a few minutes before they let another thousand go. And then another little gap, then another thousand go. So each wave is, is spaced out. Ah. So I will be in I will be in blue wave ten on on Sunday, and I will start at I think it's ten forty three. Ten forty three, exact, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So you get ushered into these pens that are almost like sheep pens. Um, so they open one side of it, and you all go in, and you can't go anywhere beyond there. And then eventually they open the other end, and you filter around and walk around to where the start line itself is. And you get held at the start line and then there's lots of noise and lots of commentary and a little grandstand and all that sort of stuff. And the adrenaline builds and and then off you go. And five hours later, you find yourself somewhere near Buckingham Palace. And I remember then it was still like five or ten minutes before you could actually still get going just for the amount of people trying to funnel their way through. I think it's different now, Jody. I think these waves that they do now is, is slightly different probably to when you did it. Yeah, it um, sounds like so, it. Yeah, so when, when you set off now, I mean, from experience of last year, and I was blue start line last year, the first mile is a very, very big, wide, open dual carriageway with no no traffic on it, obviously. Great. So 
there's loads of space for the first mile or so, which is great because people find their own natural paces. Yeah. Some people are faster than others. Some people do a, a, a phrase that people won't have probably heard of, but there is a, a running technique called Jeffing, which is named after Jeff Galloway. And yeah. Jeff Galloway came up with this philosophy of you don't have to run 26 miles to run a marathon. You could run two minutes, walk a minute, run two minutes, walk a minute, or you could run three minutes, walk a minute, or you could run two and a half minutes, walk a minute and a half. There are lots and lots of different Jeffing platforms, and a lot of people work to those. Ah, they set their nice. they set their running watches to beep at them to say run, and it beeps again. It says walk, and and if you've got a dedicated pace on your runs, yeah, it will get you round at a time. The theory of that is you're recovering, so your muscles on your walk, you're recovering, so your muscles aren't working constantly, constantly, constantly. They're getting some getting some um, relief, yes. if you like. Yeah, it's almost like a a, a, a huge hit class, then, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it is really. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is that people will just stop. <laughs> yeah. You're running right behind somebody and they'll suddenly stop because they're going to, they're doing a Jeffrey program. And the, the etiquette is you either move to the side, one side or the other, or you put your hand up to let people know you're about to stop or whatever. But not everybody does that, of course. No, I can't Nobody imagine. indicates right in the car, so they're not going to indicate when they're uh, on, on trainers. And how did you feel when you crossed that finishing line last year? Um very relieved <laughs> um it's it's really hard to explain it's you, you're obviously a little bit emotional because you've you've now achieved something that uh, again a little fact for you uh, only one percent of the world's population ever run a marathon wow fact, i didn't know that one, less than one percent of the world's population have ever run a marathon um so if you've run more than one i guess you're in a even greater percentage yeah. and I'm, i haven't run more than one yet but hopefully by sunday i'll be able to say that yeah um and the other little known fact is if people are brave enough to get to the start line more than 99 percent of starters finish great so not that many people fail to finish a lot of people say oh i'm just worried i'm not going to get you will get round the crowd will bring you around the people in the in the race will bring you around they're, they're, the thing about the London Marathon that is so inspiring, I suppose. Running around last year, you, you go past places and there's music blaring out of every pub and there's live bands in different places. You can't even start to understand the atmosphere yeah. um, unless, you've, unless you've been there and done it. They estimate that on a, on a good weather day, around about a million spectators on the course, which just blows your mind to think there's that many yeah. people out there. I remember running past places last year, you know, what looks like rough old boozers and guys out there, East End guys out there, and and they're and they're shouting your name. Yeah. But they're not just they're not just leaning on the barrier going, go on, mate, go on, yeah, you're doing all right. They proper full on shout, you know, go on, Dave, you're good. Yeah. Mate. Proper proper shout, and and the encouragement is unbelievable, and it's not just at the side of the road. People within the race itself. You know, somebody's just having a bit of a bad time or they look like they're puffing and blowing. You just say, come on, mate, you've got this. Come on, come on, let's go again. Come on. And and you you, you kind of encourage them to move again. Um, and it's just, the, the camaraderie is just unbelievable. People you've never met before in your life, people you never see again in your life. Um, but for the day, be your best mate. And that's the good thing about it. The more they see somebody struggling, the more they spur you on as well. So yeah, like you absolutely. said, I'm not surprised that 99% of people finish over that because it is, it's inspirational doing it. It is. It is. You're not, you are out there on your own, but you're not, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, because there's so many people that have got your back, you know, you, you must have your name on your shirt. It's, it's, it's law. If you don't have your name on the shirt, they're not going to shout your name. Um, they're just unless you're Mo Farah and everyone knows your name, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're probably going to shout something like, Go on, you old grey git, just move your body or whatever, you know. <laughs> so, you got to have your name on your shirt, right? Well, now, I've got, talk... I've, got my, I've got I've got mine on my shirt ready, but this time I'm running as, as Sully. Oh, so it's... they'll be shouting Sully at you, yeah, because that's my nickname for, for, for my surname, always has been through my life. And then there's um, there's three people that I'm running for, so that's on there as well. Oh, nice. That's good so to that's, have that uh, on. That's, uh, that's my running shirt for Sunday. 
So talking more generally about running, what benefits have you felt since you've been a professional runner? Oh, professional runner's a harsh statement. <laughs> <laughs> professional um, part runner? <laughs> just, I don't know. It's For me, it becomes infectious. I started with the little bits and, and then one thing led to another. It became part run and then, okay, let's try and go from part run to 10K. And then from 10K, well, if we did another six kilometers, that's 10 mile. We could probably do a 10 miler. And then it became a half marathon. Um, I was only sat talking with my, my son recently and we were looking back over the last 12 months because I've trained two blocks in the last 12 months for marathons. By the time we get past Sunday, I'll have run two full marathons and 18 half marathons wow. in 10 months. That is shocking stats, isn't it? <laughs> and there's quite a lot of sort of 10 or 11, 12 milers in there as well that aren't obviously half, half, uh, half yeah. marathons. But, um, so it's a lot of work. It takes an awful lot of dedication. So far this year, I've run just under 400 miles. Fantastic, Dave. You must feel there's such an achievement with that. Yeah, it, it, it builds. You know, you can't, you can't go from sitting on the sofa to saying, right, six months I'll run a marathon you know it took me three years to build up to doing my first marathon um but I firmly believe anybody that hasn't got a, a disability that prevents it anybody can do it so yeah. fun fundamentally it doesn't I'm not talking about how quick you do it fundamentally it's putting one foot in front of the other whether you walk it whether you run it whether you do a bit of both or whether you run the whole lot really quick 26.2 miles whether you walk it or run it it's 26.2 miles at the end of it you still get a medal you still get a t-shirt yeah anybody can do a distance if they train for it it's preparing your body your body's you well know the body is capable of incredible things it's also capable of some horrible things that you don't want it yeah. to do and that's put on when you eat too much crisps <laughs> but if you don't if you don't do all the wrong stuff your body's capable of doing a lot of really good stuff so if you fuel, fuel it right, you can do whatever you want to do. I've always said, that in my analogy world, the human body is a bit like a car. If you want to put second grade fuel in it and you want to treat it rubbish and you never clean it, and you never service it, it's not going to run very well for very long. But if you put decent fuel in, i.e. food, and if you look after it and treat it well, It'll run well for right you. now going back to the exact logistics again of your training program now you've trained for it twice what was the best fitness advice you were given is it all about just running as much as you can or do you think other training like resistance and stuff can help uh there there is more to it i mean you, you can just follow a running plan um but there are lots of other things you can do to build up strength so as I touched a little while ago, I joined a running club, Shelton Striders, back in January for this time round. And we've done track sessions every Wednesday night at more ways around the track. And a lot of that is uh, a tempo and interval training. So instead of just going and running for 40 minutes or an hour, there will be structured sessions week on week on week. Um, some of them might be three minute run and then a one minute either jog or walk recovery, then three minute run, one minute jog recovery, or they may be two minutes and a minute, or they might be a minute full on, almost full on sprint and then walk for a minute. So it's it's building up power and strength um, and then learning all the right stretching to do both before and after uh, any exercise makes a massive difference in terms of not only your performance, but also recovery and looking after your muscles because if you don't stretch your muscles before you do a significant workout, chances are you're going to pick some sort of injury up. Yeah. Fortunately, I've stayed injury free through both of my training sessions so far, apart from a little groin strain that I had this time round, which lasted a couple of weeks. So I missed one of my Saturday runs due to that. But generally, I would say anybody that wants to run a marathon, seek some local advice. There are running clubs about and, and don't get hooked on the thought that, well, if I join a running club, I'm not really much of a runner. A lot of these running clubs are community based. Yeah. And they're not they're not for elite athletes. They're for people like all of us that just want to be better, want to be out, want to be active. And there are all people of all abilities, all ages. I mean, Shelton Striders have got young lads in their 
late teens, early 20s, right through to, believe it or not, people even older than me. Older and than you? From, yeah. <laughs> you make it sound like you're 80, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Our, uh, my running coach, Gerard Moss, bless him, is, is I think he's just about to turn 70, or he might have just turned 70. Yeah. And his, his part run time, even now, is around about, 21 minutes wow inspirational that is isn't it and he and he is aiming to do he's running the marathon himself on on sunday and i believe he's aiming to be pretty close to three hour three hour mark Fantastic. and he has he has qualified by being good for age yeah so that's another way of getting into the marathon <laughs> you have to be good for age and such an how old I am, I, I said I would run my first marathon when I, was, when I was 60, which is what I did. So I'm now 61. I've had a birthday since. And for me to qualify by good for age, I would have to run at three minute, uh, three hours, 45. Oh, wow. To qualify for being good for age. So when you hear about people being good for age, they are good for age. That's a real achievement, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So they're, they're super quick. Right now, so, let's talk. Like say, run clubs of all abilities. So, if anybody's out there and thinks, "Well, yeah, I'd like to join something, but I'm a bit scared about, you know, what my ability is," don't be. They, Honestly, these guys are great. Again, a lot of these running clubs they actually target specific things for the people that come along as well. So, again, it's not yeah. just some textbook plan, is it? They, it really is a community. It is, yeah, very much so. There's people that, I mean, I've, I've spoken to guys there that are very, very good, experienced runners, been running for 20 plus years, never, ever ran a marathon, never, ever will. Yeah. Because they just don't want to do that. They don't want to commit the time to the training. They don't want to put the bodies through it, but they will run 10Ks, 10 milers, half marathons, maybe, but, but nothing more. There are other guys there that are absolute animals and they do ultras and they, they'll run. I mean, there was a guy the other weekend, they went running up in, in the hills, um, up in the, the North Derbyshire hills, and they did a 50 kilometre run up and down hills and mountains. Wow, that's hardcore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of these guys, you know, they're proper, you know, proper fit and they do a lot of off road trailing. I've never run off road. All my runs been been firm ground based so far. But I'm assured trail running builds your strength even more because you engage a lot more muscles with yeah. trail running because you're engaging the core, because you're twisting, you're turning, you're going over different terrain. Uh, you need different footwear, of course. Um, but that might be uh, that might be something I get into next. We'll see. That's right. something Let's... you've got to for something else, haven't you? Let's talk about nutritional advice. Again, what's kind of yeah. the best information have you been given? Is it true that jelly bean jelly babies are essential? Uh, jelly babies are a good source. They are Great. definitely a good source of um, good source of quick injection of of um, uh, energy. Um, different people do different things. One of the things that I adopted last year, very early on, was being aware that London Marathon is sponsored by Lucas Aid, and they they do hand out at three or four stations the, the Lucas Aid gels. They're very much an acquired taste. They don't agree with everybody's tummy. Um, oh. So if you're going to take going to take them out on a run, you really need to know that you're okay and probably take them out on a run when you're not too far from home first. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> handy tip number one. So I've run with those. So I now have um, running sh running underpants that have two little pockets in, and running shorts that has another side pocket in that I can stuff with gels. Clever. So I've set off on Saturday with six six gel stuff down my um, pockets. And then I've got a running belt, which I'll have my phone in. And I've also got um, my latest um, go-to food. And I have used things like malt loaf. I have used things like jelly babies. But I've also got some, I've had some dental issues over the years, uh, which I'll talk on a little bit more if you like in a minute. But what I've turned to now is Kendall Mint Cake. Oh, Kendall mint cake is absolutely brilliant. Pure sugar, food. that is. Yeah, but it's dead easy. To, it gets into the body quickly because it dissolves so quickly. Yeah, that it's easy to eat. Now, when you're running and you're getting short of breath and you've got to try and keep a tempo and keep your breathing good, when you're chewing on malt loaf or chewing on a jelly baby, it takes more time and more effort to consume it. 
as Kendall Minke, break a bit off, put it in the mouth, it almost dissolves straight away and it's in. Perfect. And it's working almost straight away. So I'll be taking those as well. Um, but just to add to uh, to the, the challenge that I face this time round, um, I have had some dental issues over a number of years because I've got a, a had, still do have, I suppose, a disease in my jawbone and gums that has yeah. meant that my jawbone and my gums have eroded away over time. Because of that, over the last 20 years, teeth then become loose and then they've got to go. Um, so just over two weeks ago, I had to have nine teeth out as well. So just to make life a little bit more challenging for doing a marathon. Ooh. <laughs> Feeling your pain, Dave. How did that affect your running? Uh, to be honest, I, I, I recovered remarkably well and better than I thought I would. Um, so yeah, some soreness and some tenderness and, and one thing or another, but I was probably in more pain before than after because yeah. before they were, my teeth were very sensitive. The ones that needed to come out because, um, nerves were getting close to being exposed and then the cold air running through and all that sort of thing. I did have sessions at Morways where I had to sit out for 10 minutes, just holding my jaw because I was in so much pain and then it'd subside and then I'd get back on the track and carry on again. Um, so it's probably worse before I had the treatment than afterwards. So just that, just add is a little bit to the challenge as well. Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on lifestyle as well because we were going to do oh, this. Sorry, you, you, sorry, Jody, you asking me about nutrition? We talked about the nice bits of nutrition. Yeah. Um, lots of things you can also do. So as uh, a product called Tailwind that I use. It's an additive that can go into water or uh, orange juice or or whatever. I take that out with me that will give your electrolytes a bit of a boost. So it replenishes your muscles better. But talk about the best bit of advice I've ever had. Talk to me again on Monday to be sure. But um, all of this week I've been taking the, I don't know if you've heard of a product called Beat It. No. Okay, so Beat It is, uh, they're just small little 700 millilitres, silliliter, milliliter uh, bottles. And it's pure condensed beetroot. It has around about, I think it's, I think it has 16 compressed beetroots in it. Wow. And what's that going to do? Uh, well, apart from turning your pee red, um, it's, uh, it, it opens, well, it, it reduces your um, uh, blood pressure for one. Yeah. And it's, it allows the muscles to become more receptive to fluids and nutrients, glucose, proteins, and sustains exercise longer before you hit the wall or really start to struggle. Great. And I spoke to loads of people who have used it and they swear by it. So I'm taking a bottle of that every morning, a bottle every evening, six days before the marathon, and then one on marathon morning. And yep. I'm assured it makes a massive difference. But I say that to me again on Monday. But How does it I taste? Um, well, I quite like beetroot. If you don't like beetroot, it'll be horrible yeah. because it is pure beetroot. Um, it's it's not the nicest thing you've ever drank, but it's probably not the worst either. Um, but the easiest thing is just gulp it down and then swell it down with something else, I suppose. Um, but I spoke to a guy when I went to the expo exhibition, pick up my number on Wednesday. There was a guy at the beat it stand. And I just wanted to pick a few people's brains. So I said to him, look, I've started taking this stuff just because other people said it's a good thing to do. Am I doing the right thing? Is it a stupid thing to do? This guy said, I've used it for three of my last marathons and every time I've PB'd. Amazing. Sounds amazing. Well done. That's a great top tip. So, yeah, but beetroot is is absolutely brilliant for, yeah. for, um, for exercise. Um, but, yeah, just eat healthy you know eat healthy all, all the, the usual stuff this week i've had three days of i wouldn't say carb depletion completely but sunday monday tuesday i tried to really minimize carbs because another top tip is when you're going into a long distance run your body needs a load of carbs so you will carb load or the, the idea is to carb load yeah. used to be people used to talk about pasta parties the night before which is it's very old hat now that doesn't work all it does is stodge you and likely to give you a stitch the next day. Yeah. But if you do increase your carb loads on the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, your body will then store those carbs to be able to slow release 
for the first part, maybe a third of the race on Sunday. Then the gels start kicking in. That's why you take the gels so it replenishes. So you're refueling as as you go. Um, I was going to say something else about the uh, the pre-fueling. Um, oh, I know what it was. Um, the idea of carb depletion for two or three days is if you cut carbs down for two or three days, when you then go to carb load, your body can't get enough of it. So because you've starved it of carbs for two or three days, the body's going, oh, where's my carbs? Yeah. And then you start going, hey, go have a load of that. And you chuck a bucket of uh, the carbs at it. And it goes, I'll have that. I'll store all that because I'm not sure I'm going to get some more. So for two or three days, it stores more because it's been depleted for two or three days. Yeah. So I've learned a lot more for this marathon than I even learned for the last one. But uh, it's not not always just as straightforward as sticking a pair of runners on and, and getting out yeah. the door. You know, you've got to fuel yourself right. Which is why I wanted to touch on the, the last point with this section, and that's lifestyle. You know, yesterday we were going to do the podcast, but it got to nine o'clock and you said you were trying to get to bed early. What do you think, like de-stressing and sleep, do you think it's so important with the training? Oh, it's it's, it's hugely important. I mean, it's it's... It's almost a given that you're not going to sleep well the night before a marathon. So there's no point being paranoid about I'm not going to get a good night's sleep before the marathon. Yeah. So then what you default to is two or three days before the marathon, when I haven't got it right in the forefront of my mind, I'll try and get better quality sleep in those two or three days. So I'm trying to get at least nine hours Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then if tomorrow's a restless night, it's not the end of the world because the adrenaline's going to carry you and everything else anyway. Yeah. Um, and if you're awake, you're awake for a good reason. It's because you're excited. It's because you're thinking about it. not necessarily stressing over it, but you know you you planning your routes in your mind and you're planning your activities in your mind and your your pre-race preparations and all that sort of stuff. So sleep is very very important, and it it kind of has to be important. I've I've, I've invested in a new uh, Garmin watch, which does even more things for me when I'm out on the course, but it also tells me how well my training's going, whether I'm progressing well, whether I'm overtraining. So some days it might say, you're pushing your training too hard. You need to do a, a relaxing run today. But, you know, don't run faster than, I know, six and a half minute kilometers or, or whatever. So very clever technology, but within it, it also suggests whether you're sleeping well or not so well. And nice. it will recommend that you get more sleep. So sleep is obviously an important factor. Otherwise, Garmin wouldn't include it in part of their, their training recommendations. Right, Dave, it's now time to summarise our whole podcast then. And I want you to put give us your top three tips for going from non-runner to running a marathon. Well, the first thing is you've got to want to do it. Um, you can't. You can't force somebody to do a marathon, same as you can't force somebody to give up smoking. You've got to want to do it. Um, it is fundamentally a, a, a base life skill that we all have, and that's putting one foot in front of the other. So like I said before, if you haven't got a disability that stops you doing that, I personally believe anybody can achieve whatever they want to achieve if you put your mind to it. So it's a mental battle as well as a physical one. Uh, um, so in terms of top three tips for running a marathon, rest well on your rest days, um, eat well. So eating well can sometimes be, you know, being really strict with yourself for four or five days, but then have a chippy tea on a Friday. Because yeah. You've got to still reward yourself. Um, it's not about eating lettuce leaves all the way through the whole of the process. Um, common sense stuff, really, you know, yes, you can go out drinking all the way through your training plan if you want, but I've gone out running on a Sunday morning when I've drank the night before and the difference is massive. You know, the struggle on a Sunday morning after you've had three or four pints on the night yeah. before compared to not having had three or four pints the night before, the difference is just incalculable. Yeah, um, phenomenal. So, so eating well and resting well, and the other thing that's noticeable on, on your heart rate on your wristwatch, three or four pints the night before, or the next day your resting heart rate probably goes up by five beats a minute. So it does have a huge effect. It's only two or three drinks, you, you say to yourself, but it does have a huge effect. So first of all, you've got to want to do it. Secondly, you've got to focus on what is the best way to fuel your vehicle. And, and then look after your vehicle, polish it, take care of it, love it. Um, but go out right. there and make it happen. Anybody can do it. Honestly, there's people out there that can do it. 
um, but they just don't know they can do it. Right now, at the end of the podcast, we always ask a off-topic question, and that is, it's becoming, it's going to be summer soon. You know, you deserve a holiday. Have you got a nice summer destination in your mind this year? Um, I'm not sure whether I've got a nice summer destination in mind, but Wednesday, I'm flying to Benidorm for a week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you definitely um, deserve that. Well, I planned it, planned it deliberately. Um, so immediately after the marathon, when I've gone without crisps and beer and entertainment and everything else. Um, so I've been really strict with myself. I am focused when I do these things. We've not socialised as much with friends and, and family as we, we probably normally would. Um, we haven't gone out for meals or drinks or whatever on Friday and Saturday nights because I've got to do a long run on Sunday or whatever. <laughs> um, so it's the least we can do is say, right, OK, marathon's over. I've done two in 12 months. I'm not doing another one, he says at the moment, but I've no plans to do another one at the moment. I'll have done two. I'll concentrate on 5Ks, 10Ks, 10 miles and half marathons. But then this time next year, we might be talking about me doing a 50K or something stupid. Who knows? Yeah. You're hanging around with all those ultra people now. Anything could happen, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, shall, uh, I shall enjoy some some uh, sangria in the sun on Wednesday, that's for sure. Now, I'll put up on the screen the exact web address where people can sponsor you, and there will be a link as well at, below this video. But what's the best place for people to sponsor you for, Dave? Where at? So it's it's it's, a, um, it's not a Just Give Me page. It's an enthused page. And as you say, you'll put the link up there. Click on the link. If you're a taxpayer, please click Gift Aid and fill your address in for Gift Aid because that helps. The charity had another 20%, which doesn't sound a lot, but so if you said £10, 20%, it's only two quid. Yeah, but when we're looking at raising £300,000, imagine the difference that that makes. Yeah. And if you look at the whole um, ethos of, of the London Marathon, where I believe it's it's something ridiculous, like over £100 million is raised in, in sponsorship. It is the biggest um, single fundraising thing in the world, not just the UK, in the world. Yeah. Um, and and the importance to all of the the, the very brilliant charities, um, the importance is is absolutely massive for them. Um, and if you talk to anybody that's ever run a marathon, everybody will say they want to run London. I've spoken to people from Tokyo, I've spoken to people from America, and they've said all of their life they've wanted to run London. Yeah. London is the one to run. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, hundred percent. Your target on the page is to get to 2,000. You've gone over 1,000. Are we going to do it, Dave? Are we going to get it past the line? Yeah, no problem at all. My, my company are, are going to sponsor me. They haven't put any money in yet, and they, they will put a few hundred quid in. They usually do. Um, I've got a collection pot that uh, one of my friends is, um, has got at the Chelliston Post Office. Um, so there'll be some money in there. I don't know how much yet. And... Um, my stepfather-in-law has dementia. He's one of the names on my my vest. Yeah. And they go to a dementia club every Wednesday and they've got about 200 quid in, in the pot. So I right. know on the day last year, there was a lot more donations that came in. So yeah, being at, being at a thousand at the moment doesn't concern me at all. Um, there's a lot of generous people about it. And, and in all reality, there's very few people that are probably going to watch this or that you talk to that don't either know somebody or have got a family member that suffered some form of dementia. Yeah. Um, we've all, we've all been touched by it somewhere, somehow. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if people can donate, whether it's a pound, whether it's 10 pound, whether it's more great, you know, everything helps. Um, and it all goes towards, um, putting people on the telephones to give people the help when they desperately need it. Because if somebody is desperate enough to pick the phone up to call Dementia UK, they need help. Yeah. And they get the help they want right there, right then. Great. So please donate, guys, if you're listening. And thank you so much, Dave. Good and luck. Also, Joe, what, I, what I'll also do, I'll send you the free phone number that probably you can put on the bottom of here because somebody yes. might watch it that wants some support and doesn't know how to get in touch. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you the free phone number too. Yeah, if you are affected by dementia, then definitely I'll put the number on the screen right now. That's where you can get support. Great. Perfect. 
Well, enjoy it, Dave. We look forward to I'll seeing try. your results and we'll be looking out. Have you got your shirt there? Show them your shirt again where we can look out for you. And it's Sully, isn't it? It's Sully. So I should be, uh, I should be out there running a Sully for Dementia UK. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. OK, we good to see you, Jody. We'll see you on the TV on Sunday. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Great. Thanks, All Jody. right. Thank you. Bye. Yes, bye bye. Please remember to like, give me a comment, share with your friends and of course subscribe to my channel. Thank you.